I made a little promise to myself and to my audience that I'd never do a show without at least one Ruben song. I thought that would be really rude, you know. And, and I broke all those promises with that download set because, because, and there was a reason for it. In a way, I envy cavemen like Oasis that can just like churn out the same bullshit track after track year after year which is some, which is to me is the opposite of music the opposite of creativity so um <laughs> i've never been able to do that but that's why they are multi-millionaires and i am you know a little uh, shit heel <laughs> sitting here in Asheville. i'm fine with that what is coming up for you uh in terms of your solo project nothing that's the announcement that i'm retiring the range of musical styles that my guest today has been able to create and release sometimes on the same record is quite staggering. From the heaviest and most aggressive forms of metal you're ever likely to hear to pop rock and industrial grunge and acoustic. You might even hear a muted banjo or an even a full big band swing number. It's a pretty unique blend. So I'm fascinated to find out more about the songwriting that has gone into all that from the great Jamie Lenman. Now, first, I suppose, has the variety of musical styles that you have created been something that has come naturally from yourself? Or are you actively striving to explore as many different edges of music as you can with your records? Uh, in the uh, worst habits of the worst interviewees, I'm going to answer your question by saying a little bit of both, which is no <laughs> answer at all. My, my initial reaction was to say that it's completely natural. And that's sort of the point in that um, that's how I consume music, so that's how I create music. And I've always been slightly confused when people um, are surprised or shocked by it. Because I think, what, I mean, who else listens to just one genre of music? I listen to all kinds of music. Um, but I suppose the striving comes in, I guess the striving, so to, to, want, to want to write something like a big band piece, comes naturally to me because I listen to a lot of big band and I'm like hey it just came out big band the striving comes in to try and get it right because you know I'm a rock and roll guy I'm a meat and two veg guitar based drums that's the discipline I come from so when it came to doing something like pretty please or, or other sort of jazzy tunes I then have to really work to realize it in a, a, a um, an appropriate fashion and I went to my uh, collaborator Richard Weno and said listen will you help me write the chart and he was like yeah you realize you need the saxophones to do a counter thing and I was like okay <laughs> you know and then and then it became about learning so with every sort of new genre of music that I write writing it is natural but then realizing it is when the striving comes in if that makes any sense sure that does because I I haven't played with brass myself but in the little bits that I've done in ska bands I understand that the tuning is even quite different so it's not necessarily the thing you could write the sheet music for if you're used to guitars and the rest so yeah it makes sense that you have some help I suppose not that side but did you I guess in your head have an idea how would you would you sing the melodies you wanted to hear how did you work with that individual well um I mean Richard Wenell is a name that's going to come up in this uh from time to time I just did a, a Con uh, two concerts with him in London at the end of last year actually with him accompanying me on piano which was great great for me he was my teacher at school my music teacher and music tech uh, you know the audience won't be privy to the technical shenanigans that we had to go through to get this started but I'm a very <laughs> low tech person I'm not frightened of technology but it doesn't that's something that doesn't come naturally to me you know so um, doing a music tech A level it was terrible. And Richard had really had to hold my hand through, you know, I, I was 16 and he would have been sort of 30, I guess, but we became pals. Um, anyway, all this is to say that it was in school doing my A-level with Richard as my teacher that I was introduced to, you know, very um, low level music software like Cool Edit Pro, I think was what it was called at the time. And, wow, yeah. and Cubase which I still mm -hmm. use. I've never got the hang of Logic. I still have a sort of a version of uh, Cubase. So from then on, from the from my very early dabblings with music software and, you know, basic MIDI, I was able to um, record perfunctory versions of any ideas I have and like put in, you know, a little trumpet line with a, a step edit. But then if you can see behind me here, I actually have, in fact, that's Richard Wennell's father's saxophone. Saxotone, right. who played the saxophones on 
um, the big band number, sadly died right at the start of the pandemic. And uh, Richard gave me one of his saxophones, which I treasure. But I also wow. have a lot of brass instruments you can't see quite as well. I got a trumpet, I got a trombone, and I have some schooling in, in brass and reed playing. So on some of the demos, if I'm feeling a little bit saucy, I can, you know, pick up a real instrument and put a few parps on there. It doesn't sound great. And then we get a professional to do it, really. Although I think I've played all the trombone on my records. Okay. Whenever, whenever we've had some trombone, it's always me. But we have had some much better um, trumpet players than me. And Saxotone did all my saxophones until he left us. What are we going to do now, Tone? I, I can't play oh, no. that good, you know. The, the Jamie Ledman saxophone era has ended, yeah. I suppose, perhaps. Or that's your next uh, venture, is to, to pick up that instrument and try and get to that level, right? I'm Don't joke. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> uh, with that range of musical potential in terms of styles and things you can go to, I wondered, does that cause potentially a bit of an unusual writer's block if you're kind of spoilt for choice of where you could take a song is that something you you feel or is that not at all a, a, an issue do you, do you when you start writing a song do you have an idea in your head of where it, you want it to go musically to start with yeah just because my answer is no doesn't mean that's a bad question it's a great question because it's the, all right you, you can't offend me don't worry i'm no. fine <laughs> but the but the unlimited canvas yeah it, that's it that can be stifling in a bizarre way that like sometimes you need some strictures and some rules and being um, a stereotypical Englishman in many ways, like an offensive caricature of an Englishman, you know, I thrive on rules. Give me a grid. <laughs> you know, I love it. Tell me what to do and where to be. That's how I was brought up. But um, the unlimited canvas. No, in some in some th places, certainly in my illustration work, which is another part of my career, an unlimited canvas can be quite daunting, but musically it's always been um, um, very freeing and um, m instrumentation has never dictated what I write. You know, I might write something for bassoon, I haven't, but I might. Uh, and like when I did the big band number, like I didn't know any saxophone players or any trumpet players or whatever, but I'd written a big band number and then I had to sort it out, you know. So I just write what I write and then I worry about how to do it later. On that note, actually, I wondered if that would might be the case as well for the guitar work, because having seen some of the things you've needed to perform live in terms of the complexity and busyness of the guitar, jumping between several frets at a time whilst doing a different vocal rhythm over the top, do you consider how are you going to reproduce this thing live when you're writing or do you write for the song first and then think I'll figure it out later? No, never. I, I never think about life when I'm writing ever. And um, the more recently, the last few years, I've been playing with a, a, um, a bass pickup that turns my top string on my guitar into a bass. So it means that my ha the bass and the guitar can't ever diverge, really, unless I get really clever. Right. Um, <laughs> And I know, and I, I got a lot of questions during that time of people asking, oh, does, is this going to affect your writing? Are you going to always, because punk is the bass always follows the guitar anyway. And people mm -hmm. would say, does that mean you're going to write stuff now? The bass will always follow the guitar and we'll never have those bits where the bass is low and maybe the guitar is high. And I did worry, actually, is this going to affect it? But then like, nah. And again, you know, I wrote my last record with a lot of um, guitar solos and high guitar lines that diverged from the bass. And the solution was to hire an extra guitarist to play live, you know, so I never let the musical um, limitations of live affect writing. Live is always a separate puzzle that I enjoy sorting out later. But it's nice of you to point out uh, how difficult it is to play like one rhythm on the guitar and then sing one rhythm. That's tricky. Thanks for noticing. Yeah, very tricky. I'm always impressed when bassists can do that because I think that's particularly <laughs> wild. But certainly, yeah, for I've I've seen some of your your complex riffage that you would then have to sing a different thing over the top, and that perplexed me entirely. I don't always get it right. It doesn't always come off. Don't freeze frame that <laughs> bullshit. That's all right. Well, you know, there's a looseness to live. You can do. Sure. You can do what you like. Yeah. Uh, Back to a point you were making earlier about your illustration, we had a question from one of the uh, audience members of this channel saying, as you're an illustrator as well, it's another creative art form, is there some crossover you notice in, you referenced the, the blank canvas there, in when you're approaching a song versus when you're approaching visual art? Are there 
is there a safe Venn diagram in the middle where they, they cross over naturally or are they quite different disciplines for yourself? They, for me, they've always been quite separate. I mean, mm, okay, so here's the one example where they're not... I would say that if one influences the other, it's always music that influences the illustration rather than, you know, I never like do a drawing and think, oh, I'm going to write a song about this. But because I've ended up doing a lot of the design work when I was in my band, we had to do it ourselves because we couldn't afford anyone else. And then um, so it became a chore that turned into a pleasure uh, on my own when I started making my own artwork. So sometimes I will write a song and then think either, oh, this kind of video would look cool or, oh, that would be a nice image for the single cover. So in that way, sometimes the music can um, influence the art, but never the other way around. And for most of my life, they've been separate because I, they were sort of separate disciplines. Even though I, when I, my early illustration career, sorry, I'm trying to answer your question more fully, uh, was for music publications. Weird, isn't it? Because I got my break um, doing cartoons for Rock Sound magazine and later for Spill magazine. So they were about music, <laughs> but I was writing music at the same time and sometimes in the same magazine, you know, they'd have my cartoon and they'd have a review <laughs> of my single and I did it under different names so it wouldn't get confused. So they've always been dancing around each other, right. but only on certain occasions... As in, you know, for instance, my record Shuffle, where I designed a different logo for every single song, do they truly mesh? And that's why I had so much fun on that project, because it was um, it was all of me in one go. Whereas most of the time, they're, they're quite separate. Sorry, did that answer your question at all? Yeah, it did. It did. I didn't. Can I just double check my what I heard there? Did the illustrative work in Rock Sound, etc. predate your musical releases in, in the Ruben era? Is that what you were saying? Um no, in fact, oh, okay. it was, it was, I think it was at a Ruben gig where I bullied Darren, the editor, into giving me a slot in the magazine. So nice. professionally, okay. yeah, they sort of dovetailed, yeah. I mean, it's difficult. I was drawing cartoons before I was playing guitar. And I've always regarded, even though people know me best, if they know me at all, for my music, I've always regarded illustration as being really what I do. I know it's weird, isn't it? But... I regard illustration as my real job and I regard right. music still kind of as my hobby because I was your, doing your side hustle if for my will. side hustle because I was drawing first. Right. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I did not realize that in the, in the sort of timeline. It does make sense, though. Um, I was curious as well. You mentioned Shuffle, that album, which what I've enjoyed about that in particular is this is going to sound uh, uh, negative. I, do, I don't think it is. I felt it was a brave record to put out because it's, it is very fun and you've got sketches and skits within it. And also you made Popeye the Sailor Man, the heaviest song on earth. I, I, and I've noticed this in some of your records as well. Like there is a fun attitude as well as the seriousness of some of the incredibly honest lyrics and the rest. Is this related to you were saying earlier about how you enjoy a bunch of different music yourself and as most will do. So therefore, why not have all of that within the music you put out? Do you have the same thing in terms of your level of humor as well as the, the kind of core uh, honesty of lyrics that come with it as well? The the sense of humor, I think, has always been, um, even back to when I was in the band, you know, we had, in the band, we had a very specific um, brand of humor that arose from just you know, that, um, would you call it, when people are all pressed together and they start to go a little bit stir crazy, right? So, the, and our, and our humour would come through that and, and, and less on the actual records themselves, but uh, very much in the videos and, you know, when we did Studio Diaries and whatnot, we were less uh, happy to have it show up on the records because we, want, we wanted the records to be taken very seriously. And... And I guess it's just that I think that's just something to do with getting older as you, you take yourself less seriously as you get older. Things were very in the band. Things were very life and death. We we treated it as if it was life and death. We we thought our lives were on the line. Uh, and, I, and by that, I mean livelihoods. But, you know, yeah, it was very serious for us. And then, you know, when that finished and I got a job as a designer and I carried on doing illustration and I came back to music as a solo artist, there, a lot of pressure was off. And so I felt more able to include, you know, more of myself, which I guess meant more of my sense of humor. But there's still there's some very serious records. I don't know. Are there? Maybe all the records I've made since I've on my own have have had a bit more of a, a twinkle in the eye. 
possibly. I think an outsider would be able to tell me that better than I would be able to say myself. Sure. That, that, that's interesting. It makes sense. And I wondered, actually, there was a, something... I was curious to see whether this was an intentional wink or whether this was something you want to do within the song itself. But the song off Muscle Memory had the ending was it the six fingered hand where you shout slower and then the tempo gets slower and you shout slower again to get slower i giggled when i first heard that because i found that to be joyful again making the breakdown heavier as it went it but is was that you wanted the the audio the sonic landscape of that song to finish and a slow down thing or was it kind of a wink to how can we make this heavier well it was i mean the lyric is about how that a six-fingered hand of, of fear is around your neck, choking your creativity and making everyone frightened to do anything interesting and making your heartbeat slow, you know, slowly killing you. And then it was just a gift that at that point, I did want the riff to get really slow. So I just took the end of that lyric and just shout, yeah, slower, like, let's do this slower and like, no. And, you know, it starts and stops a few times as if the guy in the band is saying, no, to the band, no, slower. And it I, did feel like it was yeah, to the band itself. To the band. Yeah. But I would say that to the band. It's usually faster. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes I'll be like, no, <laughs> slower. Yeah, you can. So in that, I guess if you were going to get very metatextual, yeah, you kind of hear the rehearsal as the composition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, that's, oh, that's very interesting to hear that. Yeah, I, I suppose it makes sense. Lyrically, it, it lends to it as well. But I thought that was quite fun. I wondered as well if, and part of this is to do with the variety of music you were putting out and some of the, the choices you're making. But I have to imagine, but maybe I'm wrong, that there would be folks within the business that surrounds your releasing music that might want to or see a benefit to restricting and having you more in the same musical lane for the purposes of knowing your current audience and how we can meet them with the next record. Do you feel those pressures or are you working with folks that, that are allowing you as your artistic expression to reign free as it were? I think there was a, a period after Devolver had gone very well. The, my first, no, my second solo album, my first album with Big Scary Monsters, um, where that followed quite a concise you know set and everything's very tight and everything was the lines are very clearly drawn and we had a lot of radio play and everyone was like right the label and the management all said great you know please do another one like that <laughs> <laughs> and, and you I, went that's not how i roll <laughs> well weirdly enough weirdly enough in my mind in my mind shuffle although the tracks were weird and disparate was an attempt to repeat some of that formula because like, I did it with the same producer and sonically I was focusing on sonically typical musician right so I thought hey the basic setup is the same you know John's bass guitar I'm using all the same amps this is going to sound I wanted it to sound like a sister record and I thought you know I can't because what I couldn't do was write another 11 songs like Devolver I, I mm. could never do that so I thought, well, if I do 11 or 12, whatever, of somebody else's songs, but funnel them through that setup they have with the, me, the producer, you know, and Daniel, my drummer, then that'll be kind of like another Devolver, won't it? No, the answer is no. Uh, real failure. And then after that, everyone backed the fuck up and were like, let's just let him do what he wants. And, <laughs> you know, so I, I ruined it for everyone. Sorry. That is incredible. I'm so surprised here. That that was the attempt to sort of go with the leaning and it ended up being the opposite. I wonder if that was your inner creative just taking it in, in a direction that would made it, you know, I guess given that the sound was the same, but you'd have to find something interesting and new to do for your own, I suppose, enjoyment, right? Yeah, but a lot of a lot of the a lot of these records start with one intention in mind and finish completely almost opposite like muscle memory was my attempt at writing a cohesive record <laughs> because for, for the viewers who don't know that record this is the record where the first half is incredibly incredibly heavy and the second half is like acoustic yeah yeah okay. I, and i thought because i thought well look you know people were always criticizing my band for you know jumping between loud and quiet 
on the same record. So I thought, right, okay, let's have our cake and eat it. We'll do a whole disc of quiet and we'll do a whole disc of loud. But then even within the loud, there were so many different versions. And even within the quiet, I couldn't, I just can't write the same thing 12 times a row. And I sort of, I, in a way, I envy, you know, cavemen like Oasis that can just like churn out the same bullshit track after track year after year which is some, which is to me is the opposite of music the opposite of creativity i really despise that kind of uh you can't I, you can't even really call it music um it's just stuff isn't it it's like content it's like disney plus so um <laughs> i've never been able to do that but that's why they are multi-millionaires and i am you know a little uh shit heel <laughs> sitting here in Asheville. I'm fine with that. Sure. Yeah, there, there, there are choices, uh, you know, and ultimately you got to find what, what makes you happy. Yeah. Right? Everything else is just numbers, I suppose. Um, but within that, what I particularly enjoy about the music you create is that you do have the ability and seemingly the interest to write simple, catchy hooks, as well as the complex, you know, madness that can also exist. I'm thinking of a, a good comparison here. There is some technical busyness in one of my eyes is a clock which is a, a very frantic song but equally i know this is uh, a, a long time ago but the chorus for the first chorus of freddy krueger is one note the whole way through mm. and i was wondering if you think about this the more simplistic punches of hooks as a payoff for following moments of busyness or whether you when you're writing your music is just what what naturally comes to the next section of the song happens and it's less of a a calculated setup and punch sort of comparison well, well i i think uh i mean the two songs you picked there you know they were written for different purposes although i was still trying to be a bit clever with freddy krueger um the idea of having you know a complex let's say a complex or an aggressive or an angular verse and then like a big old chorus. That's mm. that's an idea that came out of what I call post hardcore. Um by which I mean the explosion of uh, you could I uh, even screamo basically Glassjaw, right? At the start of the noughties and at the end of the nineties, Glassjaw released their album, um What's the second one? Worship and Tribute, which is referenced in a Ruben song, I think. And then all of a sudden, everyone was doing it, and the, and the emo explosion. But but I I was more focused on the post hardcore element, which seemed to be you get you get clever and aggressive in the verse, and then you whack out a big chorus. And there is no finer example of it than Worship and Tribute, because every single one of them songs has this frantic mayhem with Palumbo like screaming over the top. And then the chorus, it just opens up and he's got this fabulous voice. And obviously Ross Robinson has been like, here's where the money's at, you know, especially on that second record, the production is really Hollywood style. So that came from post hardcore to a love. I mean, everyone loves big choruses anyway, but then we love the technical business of things like at the driving and another uh, Ross Robinson band. Um, so yeah, that's where we got the combo. And to me, that's what post-hardcore means. I mean, everyone's got a, a million different definitions for every genre of music you want to bring up, particularly mm. emo. I've had like week-long arguments about the definition of what emo is, you know. But post-hardcore... Yeah, it seems very wide as a definition. There's so much, currently. there's so much. But, but I love, I've always loved like aggressive versus melodic choruses. And, and to me, that's post-hardcore. And that's how I write most of my music. I see. And I wonder as well, in terms of getting into the, the songs, I, there are many ways, obviously, to write a song. If you, you, I mean, you can see that in your own disc discography anyway, the variety that's in there. You could write a song by focusing on what a guitar riff that comes to you as your jamming, or you could think of what is a vocal hook I want to have. But something that stuck out in one of your lyrics, I'd never really considered before, which is, this was in Agony, Agatha. You said, sometimes when you're trying to write songs, you imagine turning on the radio and thinking, what would you like to hear on it? And maybe think that, hey, is that a, a, a throwaway jaunty line or is that something you actually would do as, as a way of trying to think of a new song? And if so, imagine you'd hear an entire song and the need to reverse engineer what guitar parts would support that sound I want to hear and what vocals would support that. Is that something that you would, you would do? 
It's it's more out of frustration when that would happen. That's definitely happened. Yes, absolutely. And there's a, there a couple of songs on that record that were written in that kind of way. In, just in response to what I was saying earlier about crap like Oasis, you know, feeding it to you through these pipes. And now Spotify does the same thing. And, and I would just, it's not like I would sit and think, I have to write a song today. Let's do a thought experiment. I don't work like that. But, um, but if I had the stimulus, like a shit song on the radio or a boring band, very often I, one of the songs on that record was inspired by just such a lackluster performance from a band who I won't name. And I is I was, it a band that you mentioned their name repeatedly in a song? Is it that one? No, no, oh. no. Okay. And maybe that was the radio one. But I was at a show by a band, and they just sucked so hard. And and <laughs> they were on a stage so big, and they held all this gear. And I looked at them. And I thought, "Fuck you guys, man! If I had all this gear, if I had all this crowd, I wouldn't play this to them. I would play this to them." And in that flash i got the riff for the end of um three hail marys i thought ooh, i'd really you want to play something big and hard through these amps and then they'd fucking pay attention you know um and yeah and so it, when i'm what i'm talking about an agony agatha is yeah if i did ever turn the radio on and it was pumping out some rubbish i'd always think god damn it why can't it be good like and and very quickly my brain would show me just a quick window of what I, I might like to hear and I'd be like yeah and I'd get a guitar <laughs> so I can't force it it has to be uh, it has to be revealed to me through a window of uh, rage <laughs> if it works everyone's got their process right yeah no certainly I in my I've not written a song in many years but when I was in my twenties I was twenties uh, I was touring in in bands and any time I sat down being like right we're gonna write a song it always turned out to be garbage. Like never, <laughs> never excited. The next day you listen to be like, what was the point of that? Yes, I I never understand um, bands who go in to write sessions. I think Frank told me that Million Dead, you know, wrote their second album from start to finish in one two week session, and it's a really good album, and the songs are really good, and you're like, wow, <laughs> that you know that's really impressive. And there are other bands that I really like. There was a band called um, Castrovalva who I did a couple of shows with, they made their records, you know, on the day. They went in the studio for 24 hours and just recorded whatever came out. And oh that God. is something that I would love to do. My pal Haggard Cat did a record like that as well. And like, it's not Sgt. Pepper's, but it's a burst of something. And you know, those Castrovalva records, they're not for everyone, but they've got distinct tunes. I could hum you some tunes. What, um, this is gonna derail your interview um, but I should ask, it was rude of me not to research you before we did this interview. And you mentioned not being in bands. What what bands were you touring with? Oh, you wouldn't you wouldn't know of them. Don't worry. Uh, so the, the one that was the most successful one, arguably, was a, a hip hop band. So somewhere between the Fugees and the Black Eyed Peas. Um, so we did fairly well touring Europe and the rest. I was also a singer a uh, guitarist in a pop punk band called Second Chance who did very you know a, a tour of France and a couple of tours of the UK but two that you know, counts. small venues in international sure. yeah yeah Great. absolutely uh, I was in a ska band who also did pretty well actually for a while got, got a song on BBC Radio 6 that was what, a big what was the us. band they were called Make It Better Later we were t gigging with bands like Zebrahead and Wheatus was one of our biggest supports we got to do. Wow. And Sonic Boom 6 or The Toasters, that kind of, oh, yeah. that kind of world. So we're talking kind of uh, third wave ska, like Boston's kind of ska punk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's hard to describe it because we also wrote songs about pirates and we had, you know, some weird stuff in there. <laughs> Sounds uh, great. We had some fun with it. But yeah, that no, was great crack. But, you know, as you, I'm sure, can... To, testament to it doesn't really help you buy a house and i related so hard to the lyrics in return of the jedi like you know when that when that came out and i was trying to make it as a, as a musician being like you know sometimes you might think i might want to buy a house one day but it is tough out there when it's every tough. tour essentially costs you money yeah um, and i, mean, I, I, I ended up getting to 28 and going yeah i'm i would like to i don't know buy a nice house at some point yeah. and now now i've been working in a creative tech industry as my main profession as it were and then i do the rock on the side these days rock on the side i it's funny you mentioned you mentioned that song that's on the second album isn't it and um weirdly enough by the time the second album came along so probably after i'd written that song we were 
talking to a publisher and between the second album and the third album we signed a publishing deal for a a very small amount of money and yet i did put my share up into a house as a deposit so if I I was nice. I was able to buy a house, a small house, and actually it was a flat, um, through rock and roll. So um, I don't want to disappoint the point you made there, but I, you know I did. Rock <laughs> Here's and roll what you did. could have won, Steve. No, no, yeah. I get your point. That's that's great to yeah. know that that because sometimes after works. that album came another album, and either you were just like homing missling down into poverty, or you were able to somehow stay afloat, right? <laughs> It was. I mean, it's been it's been difficult, and it's been mostly illustration and a, a fair bit of chip shop. But I did. I used that um, publishing advance to put a deposit on a house. The best decision I ever made. I was so young, and I had just just chunk of money. I was like, shit, <laughs> gonna buy a house. <laughs> Case it all. I better put finishes. this somewhere before I do something bad with exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's best decision I ever made. That's great. And how? I mean. Uh, you don't have to answer this question, but how are things in the current era in terms of the sustainability of your ability to do the bands or your your solo stuff? But is I guess is the illustration the main breadwinner for yourself that keeps the stability, and then you have the side hustle, as it were, doing your solo stuff when you can. Yes, well, I mean, I don't mind admitting to you or to your viewers that I have a very strange relationship with um, the money I earn from music. I apart from putting that deposit you know so let's take a case in point i i got a chunk of money for a publishing deal it was really very small in the scheme of things and so was the flat i bought with it you know but i put that chunk of money into a flat but then when it came to paying the mortgage or the rent whatever i was very reluctant to use any of the money that i'd made from music one of the reasons was that all the money in when we were in the band went into a central account you know, so we never saw any of it. It just went back into funding, you know, the next tour or as the case was for the next record, that the next record we used it to set up our record label. We never saw any of it. Um, and even later, so so at that point, I was relying on my um, money from illustration and the chip shop. And then later I, I got a job at a design agency in London. And that was a fairly solvent period because I had, a, you know, a nine to five job. And again, that same song talks about, you know, having a nine to five. I, you know, I got one in the end. It was a creative nine to five, but still, you know, I had to turn up for work and wear a suit. I didn't have to wear a suit, but I did. Everyone else has a T-shirt and jeans. And uh, <laughs> so I never used the money from music. And still to this day, I do not use the money I get from music. And it is a very small amount of money to pay the bills, not even to go towards it. I've got a thing in my brain where I can't let myself and it's only money from illustration and l latterly journalism, I do a lot of writing, that I use to pay the mortgage and the money from music sort of goes into account and dribbles up and every now and then it becomes a chunk and I might, you know, buy a Dalek or something stupid, but I rarely do anything constructive with it and I was trying to work out why because that would seem an odd state of affairs. And there's a few reasons. One of them is that, that uh, music, it's very inconstant. So you, it's mm. never a reliable source of income. So unless you are like touring all the time, you know, like a, a working musician in the clubs every night, even and even that's a tough gig, it, it would seem imprudent to um, rely on that, uh, that income stream to pay something as regular and deadly as your mortgage. But also I think it's because when I was growing up, people would tell me time and time again it's not a proper job you know it's a hobby right. you, you're dreaming and art as a whole but particularly music is looked down upon and everyone would say when are you going to get a real job and i'd be like oh man and so i think some of that affected me mentally and so i can't i can't i could never let music be my real job because i was always like well this is always nonsense isn't it even though I was, when i was selling like you know thousands of tickets hundreds of thousands of records, whatever. I mean, tens of thousands of records. Um, I could never think about it as my job. That's quite sad, isn't it? And I think that's why I've always relied on illustration and other things and the music money, if and when it arrives, goes to like other stuff. Weird, buy myself a toy, you know, odd. I think that makes sense. I can see certainly how if you then become reliant on something that is inherently unstable because of the 
the industry that it is, then that, there's a risk that you, I suppose, become influenced by the need to ch you know do something new musically in order to keep that stability coming in. And that might compromise the joy and artistic expression you have from it. I think I have a, a similar thing in my own world of YouTube where I'm fortunate in a way, even though I'd like to do that full time, that I have a steady income. It means I don't have to worry about, about oh, I must do a video today. It must be about this subject because I know it'll get views, et cetera. You can kind of follow your general interest, which is hopefully within art. I imagine you might relate to this is maybe the point is following your own core soul's desire. Yes. The, the, I mean, many people would say that the ideal setup is what you've described. If you have like what we would call a traditional job or a steady income somehow, and then in your free time, what there is left of it, which is the caveat, you can devote to art, and then that art will hopefully be as, as pure as possible. And that's how I made um, my records, Muscle Memory and Devolver. I was working at a design agency. I had like a grown-up job, you know? It, it, again, it was no great shakes. I was I was an illustrator designer. A very small salary in the scheme of things, but it meant I didn't have to worry about where the mortgage was going to come from that month. And so, yeah, I could devote my spare time to making exactly what kind of art I wanted. However, it did mean that I was burning the candle at both ends. You know, I, mm. <laughs> I was I was doing a nine to five and then I was going on tour in the studio and it was exhausting. And what I found was I actually got made redundant just before shuffle. <laughs> and so at that point, I was like, ah, fuck it, you know, <laughs> I just sort of, <laughs> I just sort of went into shuffle with complete abandon, expecting any day for my funds to run out and, and to need to go and get a job at Tesco's or whatever. But, you know, five years, maybe six years after that fact, I've managed to kind of stay afloat as a freelance um, illustrator and journalist, which is no less precarious than music. And yet I still feel like they're in some ways more proper. I don't know, there's, there's a weird acceptance to when you see your own name or your own product either on a rack in a record store, you know, or in a magazine that you yourself used to read as a kid, like Doctor Who magazine, you know, um, that, that makes it very real and still Picking up Doctor Who magazine feels like more of an achievement, weirdly, than seeing my face in Kerrang. And I think that's that inherent uh, thing about music not being a real job. I think that stigma is going to always be attached to it for me. Very weird, buddy. We're picking apart some bizarre uh, emotions here. Well, um, it's fascinating to me. Like this is this is the greater things in life, right? It's not just music. It touches every aspect of yeah. who we are and how we think and how we see the world. And of course, the social, you know, norms are going to come into it. And uh, so, talking of social norms, I don't know if this is a tenuous link, but one thing I definitely want to ask about is your most recent download festival performance, which I checked out, was a fascinating decision, which I was so blown away by because you played an entire set of unheard songs off a record no one had listened to yet as far mm. as i could gather and i don't know that i've ever seen anyone do that i don't think that's been done before honestly and it was as an audience member it was it was very fascinating because every three you know a couple of songs you think yeah of course he's got a new record he's gonna be playing this and then <laughs> i'm sure we're gonna get something that we know that's something that's familiar and it would as the set went on we started going I don't think it's come. I don't think we're going to get anything <laughs> we know. And you're I'm teetering between like being f furious, but also like, this is so impressive. And actually what was, what was really impressive was the songs really landed from that record in a live context. They, they, there was something about them that it did translate, even though you didn't know them, which I think is kind of rare in the rock world because generally depending on how good your sound engineer is, new songs don't necessarily translate with strength. But in that case, they, they certainly did. What led to that decision? And how was that experience for you? How did you feel before going and say, knowing what you were about to do for that set? Mm, that's a, I feel like we could have made a documentary about that set because there was so much that went into it and it broke all of my own rules because you're exactly right about 
like new material at gigs. You know, it's the last thing anyone wants to hear at a live show <laughs> is a new song. Even if it's fucking living on a prayer, you know, we, we, it's so rare that it goes over, right? And even if it does go over, people are not receptive to the idea. I went to see uh, Mastodon play at the Underworld when they before they became absolutely huge. And they played you know um a couple of tracks of what i think went on to be like their like maybe leviathan was that the big record for mastodon anyway it was before then it was before they really broke and they were like we're gonna play a couple of new tunes you know songs that would go on to be their like immortal classics um and you know we didn't realize we were in the presence of greatness and I remember after like one new tune, people kind of suffered it. And then they were like, we're going to do another new one. And one guy at the front of the crowd went, he said, pay attention. We like the old stuff. <laughs> but this, I was, I agreed with this person. And even as a mm. musician myself, you don't, no one goes to the show to hear new stuff. And we were always in the band. And as a solo artist, I was always leery of, I'd limit it to like maybe one. You might get new, one new song. And even then people would immediately leave for the bar, right? And and plus I sort of had a rule as a solo artist that um, I think when I came out as a solo artist, people weren't expecting me to play Ruben songs, right? Which is really nice that they came anyway and bought tickets anyway, expecting to hear essentially new stuff you know they'd had the record but whatever but th that was never my intention because i really loved those songs and i worked hard on them and so i, I always wanted to play ruben songs at, you know at least one if not two or three because you know that's why people are here and i like them and you know the, the guys playing in the band with me jump at the chance to play you know those particularly the drummers they like to get stuck into or what guys do yeah yeah and and so I I made a little promise to myself and to my audience that I'd never do a show without at least one Ruben song. I thought that would be really rude, you know. And and I broke all those promises with that download set because because and there was a reason for it because we had been trying to look at like what label was going to produce the record where we were going to go back with Big Scary Monsters. Or we were going to try and work with other people, and there was a lot of negotiation and the, the the record went through a long gestation period and and one of my managers quit and then a lot of things fell through we were supposed to release one or maybe even two singles early that year so the yeah. idea for download was that when we went to download people would be familiar with the material right and they would have they would have heard one or at least two tracks that we would then bring <laughs> out all right and and then I started rehearsing with um, Jen, my extra guitarist, because it was clear that the material would need another guitar. And I didn't want to um, waste her time on any songs that I could just do with Jacko, right? That, that could just be guitar, bass and drums, which basically meant the rest of my back catalogue. So we ended up concentrating on the new album with Jen. And then it came to the crunch point where we, we were rehearsing as if we were going to play all this new stuff that people would have heard. But then the singles got delayed. So I was left in this position where I was like, fuck, you know, I rehearsed all this new material and no one's heard any of it. And which way do you go? Do you lean into that? I had two, I had two options. I could either tell Jen, Jen, you've wasted your fucking time. You know, me and Jacko are just going to go out there and play all the fucking same bullshit we played last year because we'd done Download Pilot last year. I could do another boring, you know, greatest hits with no nothing new on the table. And people would say, oh, Jamie Lemon was also there and it wouldn't be anything. Or I could go all the way the other way, get Jen in, present everyone with this new sound, you know, a new look band and just play all new stuff. Because then if it was terrible or if it was amazing, people would talk about it. Even if people were like, man, Jamie Lemon took a big swing and whiffed it real hard, you know, <laughs> like absolutely died. That would be better than just, <laughs> yeah, and Jamie Lennon, you know, doing the same old Future's Dead shit off Devolver. Uh, so I knew something big would happen either way. And so I thought, fuck it, you know, I'm just going to play completely new stuff, which, you know, I swore that I would walk out if a band ever did that to me. But there you go. Everybody's got to try it <laughs> once. And then what happened was what I was not expecting, even in my wildest dreams of confidence, because I'm quite confident, and I was confident in the material, people started singing along to these new songs that they'd never heard. 
I mean, yeah. you were there. I'm not imagining this. They were no, no. By the by, like let's say the third chorus, the last chorus in whatever song, they were singing the words, and I, yeah. I just thought, you know, it was a real um, valediction, uh, vindication of like, yeah, these are straight uh, good songs, good enough to go over first time, and the reaction yeah. of the crowd was as if I'd done the greatest hits, and so I thought, wow. And the only shame is, here's the sting in the tail is that i thought fuck this proves it you know i've got lightning in a bottle this new set of songs really is going to do what i want it to do which is like massively translate reach a broader audience you know go over if it can go over this instantly with a group of hardcore yeah. metalheads you know i've got a fucking platinum record on my hands <laughs> it came out no one bought it no one listened to it F waste of fucking time so for that beautiful moment after that download set, I was walking on air and I was convinced I was going to buy a slightly bigger house with all the record sales. <laughs> it wasn't to be, but that was a glorious moment. Yeah, that's fair. And I think what helped it probably was that you didn't, after the first song, say, by the way, everyone, I'm going to be playing a bunch of new songs. I hope you're okay with that. You just went and went and went. And, and I think that's why it worked, because the risk is, we'll never know, but if you had said that, that there may have been some thinning of the crowd, but everyone's just like, you know what? This is a thing. We're in for this. <laughs> I was really, I genuinely was, ex what I expected was for a lot of people to leave. I expected like a hardcore to stick with it and be polite, and, and I would have been happy with that. But no one left. I thought there was going to be a mass exodus, but there just wasn't. It was wonderful, and I'm glad you were there. That's one of the high points of my career, if you can call it a career. That's cool. And to link back to something you said earlier about, yeah, you, you don't go to a gig hoping to hear songs you don't know. However, what is interesting is if that is the first time you hear a song is live, when you later on hear it on a record, it takes you back immediately to that live performance. Mm. It's like a sort of time capsule. I, I found that years ago, I saw, this is oh, like 22 years ago, I saw AFI at Reading Festival. Now, anytime I hear this record, I'm back as like a 14 year old in that crowd listening to it. And that is mind blowing. And yet still, if I would go to a gig, I'd be like, oh, I hope I know all the songs. <laughs> like it's, it's, we it's kind of beautiful. find ourselves. We do. I, I, I've, yeah, um, and, and that, that concept of people's expectations versus what you're giving them is something that I've butted up against my whole career. You know, people are, as soon as you do the one thing, people are, they're, they're expecting a repeat every time. And then if they don't get it, they can get like literally competitive. I, you know, towards wow. the end of the band, I had some, this guy like break into my dressing room and like grab hold of me because I didn't play the songs he wanted to hear. You know, it was, it's, it can get, physically threatening the audience's expectations mental. hey it's not as it's not as uncommon as it happened on a few occasions man so yeah it makes it very difficult to be an artist god listen to me <laughs> in my floral dressing gown no it's totally fair i have to imagine that kind of experience wouldn't make you go jesus christ i better play that song every gig from now on because I, I otherwise i might get hit in the face yeah or but let's is... or let's jack this band in a fuck all of y'all which is what i did yeah, some cord, some kind of rip cord is going to get pulled. Yeah, uh, Jesus. Now, uh, uh, one thing that is of interest to me, having seen your your work over the years, this is going to be an odd segue in a way. I wonder how I'm going to get into this, but I remember this is this will illustrate how long I've been uh, enjoying the music you've been putting out. That many years ago, I saw Ruben on tour with Fight Star, yeah. and. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't really into Five Star during their set. I, I headed out home and I passed the merch stall and you were there wearing a baseball cap and I went over to say hello because I was a fan. And you, I don't know whether this was a jest, but you claimed that you were wearing the cap as a, to kind of disguise yourself and not be recognized. Now, what's interesting about that to me is that many, many years later, a download festival, you've got a sea of people wearing black t-shirts, but an individual walks through the crowd wearing a top hat and a waistcoat, not looking necessarily to be not recognized. Has your fashion expression changed over the years? Or is it that your inner confidence has changed over the years? Or am I totally reading into this insanity? <laughs> well, it's uh, no, it's a very interesting question. Um, and like all the questions you've asked me, it requires a, a deep and uh, highfalutin answer, I'm afraid. There, 
I remember when I was a kid and I started dressing different, what we're going to call different, you know, i.e. You know, I was a rocker or a goth or whatever you want to call me. So, you know, painted nails and I had green hair and, and you know, uh, Marilyn Manson t-shirts, whatever. There was this idea and we used to get like kicked in the head for it, right? And people mm -hmm. would say, and even John from my band, Ruben, who was into rock but was smart enough to just wear the same clothes as everyone else wore, would say, hey, man, you, you're bringing it on yourself by wearing this these funky clothes, man. Why do you want to stand out so much? And I don't know what it was like for other people. I think other people do want to stand out and, you know, whatever. I never... I never wanted to stand out. And I, I know people are going to find this hard to believe and they're going to think I'm just saying this to sound interesting. Swear to God, I'm not. Whatever I'm wearing at any one point, whether it was when I was a teenager with the green hair and the eye makeup and whatever, or whether it's now in like a <clears throat> three-piece suit with a Homburg or whatever, I truly do not want to stand out. Um, I know that what I'm wearing will make me stand out, but that's by the by. Nothing I can do about that. I I wear what I wear because I like it. Um, I think it suits me. But I would prefer it if people didn't look. You know, when when I go out <laughs> with uh, my wife, who again, you know, wears um, you know unique fashions, you could say. People stop us in the street, you know, on a, a daily, sometimes hourly basis, not because they know our work, although sometimes that does happen, but very often they just want a photo of us or they'll say like, are you guys going to a wedding or all this stuff? And it can mm. get quite uh, obstructive. I really wish it's nice that people think you look nice, but but I really wish I could just blend in a bit more. And obviously the, the pat answer to that, maybe one that John might have given when we were kids was like, well, just wear a t-shirt and jeans. <laughs> you know? uh, I just don't feel comfy in that uh, crap. So, uh, I mean, I wish everyone looked like me. I think it'd be cool if everyone wore like three piece suits or whatever. And when I was, a, I remember when I was a goth, I was like, this shit looks so good. You would look so great with like, you know, a black hoodie instead of that Alessi crap you're wearing, you know, hey, I always think what I'm wearing is, is sensible for everyone. And I, rather than standing out, I, w I wish I was just one of, of many. So it's, it's, it's never been about standing out. And um, I realize I've only got myself to blame if I do, but it's a secondary, tertiary even um, concern. Sure. Good use of the word tertiary. I enjoyed that. Uh, there was a, a, an audience question as well, kind of related to that. Is where where do you draw your inspiration from when it comes to your combination of music and fashion? They said specifically. So how, where do you draw from for the, the kind of attire choices you have? Well, if we're talking about my whole career, sorry, I just I just want to return. I'm going to get to this, but but you made the point um, when you saw me on tour with Fightstar and I was wearing that hat to, to be um, a bit anonymous. At various points, my um, self-confidence has gone through like peaks and troughs, whatever. And so at, at the moment, I feel great, you know, but in the band, God, I was under sort of a lot of mental pressure. And so it's very likely that in the band, when you met me, as stupid as it seems, because I know the hat you mean, it had like boss written on it and it was like metal. I still I still got it. Oh no, King, it had King, the King cap. Right, yeah, it was like a trucker hat. It wasn't yeah, just it was, a baseball cap. It was it. weird. Um, I would wear that stupidly. It just gave me a, a little bit of protection from people because it was that point that people did start doing things like, you know, grabbing me by the arm and saying, you should have done scared of the police, you know. And I knew I had to go out there and sell my shirts because we couldn't afford a merch person. But at the same time, I was frightened of people's attention and I was very um, fragile mentally. And so something as simple as a cap to put on your head, you know, would make me feel a little bit protected. I'm glad, I'm glad to say I don't feel like I need that protection these days. But um, in terms of how the music has fed into the choice of fashion, again, that's an adroit question. And your viewers, uh, I commend them for bringing it up because in the period you mentioned, again, I was wearing, I think I was wearing um, like the long black sort of smock top with a, just a collar out the top and the, and the, and the, the black trousers. I'd, I'd been very influenced by um, um, Refused, the Swedish hardcore band yeah. Refused. And they um, sort of dressed 
very simply and uniformly and I was into that and I've always been attracted to the idea of a uniform you know I had like all those different stripy shirts that was a uniform to take the choice out of it so I wouldn't have to like spend 30 minutes every morning going hmm or longer deciding what to wear so so at that point yeah music but also the idea of uniformity played into it the best example you could see if you look at my um, musical catalog would be muscle memory which sort of took place within an imaginary Victorian Edwardian idyll, you know, and certainly not on the thrash side of the record, but on the jazz side of the record, that's all kind of pre-war stuff. It's kind of a pre-war fantasy. And after the band finished, you know, I lost my mind a bit. <laughs> and I, I sort of retreated into history, into my love of history that was all, that had always been there to help me construct a new identity because for so long the band had been my identity and 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 then after that finished I had to look at myself and say well who are you now and for a while the answer was a Victorian gentleman <laughs> and so that's when I started wearing the suits but uh, uh, body image is very important to this as well because I gained an awful lot of weight towards the end of the band and then coming into my solo career I was a lot heavier than I am now and I suddenly didn't feel so good and it, it, you know jeans and t-shirts stopped um, being flattering not that anything's been particularly flattering on me so it felt good to sort of hide hide a bit in in those layers of tweed and if you'll notice you know as time has gone on I've shed the layers of tweed I think I even did I like, did like a topless photo shoot for Popeye, right? I've because just recall, I had to, yeah, I recall yeah. that image. Yes, yeah, just suspenders and a and a, a uh, like old school sailor hat. A sailor hat, yeah. I mean, I knew it had to be done, but uh, so you can see, it's a very uh, simple and quite revealing. Um, I think for most people, uh, um, indicator of uh, confidence and mental health. The more clothes I'm wearing, the more frightened I am. Generally, is a good rule of thumb. All right. I'll put that in my back pocket. That's good to know. Um, I, I suppose I'm hoping there's a positive answer to this, but so hearing about the horrificness that the odd fan had back in the day, if they didn't play the song they wanted, how is your relationship now having gone through that? Who is my identity doing your solo stuff, the records coming out and people enjoying them, that download did going so well as it did. Where are you now with your relationship with the audience and their expectations and how you, you do you have methods to deal with the expectations or what they might or may not be? Or are you in a different place in your mind where you don't really need the methods and you're, you're comfortable and whatever it will be, will be? Um, well, I think, I think, I mean, there's a few answers to that. The, first of all, doing muscle memory, making muscle memory, because when I was originally, you know, putting together songs for what might be my first solo album, a lot of the songs that ended up on Devolver were sort of in play. But I could hear it and I could hear like, oh, this kind of sounds like the old band. And I didn't want to come back straight away with something that was just like, here's more of the same, you know, and, and people to pigeonhole me. So then I decided, no, I'm going to do this crazy double album instead. And doing that sort of put a brick through the window of people's expectations I think it was really handy although some people have argued it wasn't the most uh, commercial move to launch your solo career with a double album of jazz and thrash and I can see that I could see that but what it did was give me the freedom to say look I'm gonna do whatever the fuck I want and second guessing me is completely pointless so don't try and since then people have stopped trying to second guess me which is really great which is really great um so that helped a lot but also what helped a lot apart from just getting older and caring less and being more confident in yourself was um you know as much as i sort of um distrust it and try to keep it at arm's length social media has allowed people to see much more behind the scenes of the artists they have a more even though it's kind of one way and parasocial i think is the term uh you get a more personal look at it behind the scenes, let's say. People take pictures of their breakfast. You know, I don't. But it, you, you used to get just like the shiny press shot and the record and an interview in Kerrang! And that was all you got. Whereas now you get a much more direct line. And so people know me as a person better, which of course is easy to do with the albums coming from just me rather than me as part of my band with John mm. and Guy. Um, so people know me better. They... Uh, they understand my process a lot better. I've got better art articulating it. 
And so people's expectations, I think my supporters have learned to um, expect the unexpected and to not place any bets on what I might do next. So me and my gang, we're in a really good place. The press and the public as a whole, however, are still expecting a repeat of whatever my last album was. And I think mm. that was what really scuttled the atheist that that one with, that I felt sure was full of all those crossover hits. Everyone else and all the reviews were like, "Hey, this isn't as dark and mean as his records usually are." Meaning, you know, King of Clubs. They all thought they were reviewing my previous record, which is such yeah. that's lazy journalism, you know. And I just didn't catch on. People were people didn't want to hear like, you know, uh, a rock ballad, uh, power ballad queen-esque guitar solo love song about my wife they wanted to hear like a dirty electro grungy stomp about how i wanted to kill myself because that's what my last record was and no one knew what to deal with it and that's always where i've kind of fallen afoul of the press and the public as a whole is that people have an idea of you and and if you're not paying attention that it's going to change if with me that's going to change so they tend to get a bit blindsided when I suddenly come out with this, you know, I'm walking on a beach in a sun hat and sunglasses saying, hey, everything's cool. And not singing like, pull me apart. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I've changed my mind. Two years is a long time, man. Yeah. No, and, and you're right. Lazy journalism. It speaks to that they, they don't know what, what the previous record, or the one before that has, has been like. Because it's all, it's all there. The, the, the breadcrumbs are throughout. And I, for one, certainly enjoy you know, any new record that you put out or go into a live show has clearly download illustrated is like we don't know what this is going to be we're along for the ride let's enjoy this almost as a conversation in its own way it's kind of it's very cool um i do want to wrap this up because we've got things to do i'm sure in our own lives but i understand at the time of this recording you're about to have an announcement and then th this will go out after that happens but um just out of interest in this current phase in your life what is what is coming up for you uh in terms of your solo project nothing that's the announcement that I'm retiring, right? <laughs> oh, shit. Did, did you know this? Did I brief you on this? No, no what? <laughs> no. Sorry, what I don't mean is spring this on you. So yes, at the time of recording, um, I basically made the uh, decision after the album tour last year that I was not going to do it anymore because you know I've been doing it for ten years as a solo artist and then you know. 15 years with the band and with a bit of a break in the middle and it's just it's it's become really exhausting and also the way that the industry operates is uh completely changed and is totally crazy and doesn't really seem to have much to do with music anymore so um i need to take a a big step back or i'm gonna go nuts again i went a bit nuts at the end of the band and really i should have pulled i should have put the brakes on before it got to that stage before everything imploded and maybe you might have had a couple more ruben records sorry if i'd have been smart enough to take a break so yeah i'm retiring from touring um i'm not going to do any more of my own shows uh you know under the come see jamie lemon that won't happen again i might do a, the odd festival or two if if they ask me nicely but i'm you know i no longer have an agent looking for shows whatever um and i'm not gonna make any more albums certainly not for a long time because the shenanigans that goes it is involved in you know raising the money to make it and then all the stuff you've got to do on the other end to to justify this eh, you know it's it's exhausting i'm i'm burned out so i'm stopping that <laughs> i'm stopping that but what i'm I doing i thought you were joking when you started i was like what well, i thought this was, you're actually you're you're taking a, a an indefinite pause from from the touring and from and albums that from is, the music industry is it is a more wow. accurate way to say it you know i i still want to have a relationship with music and I, you know i'll never stop writing because I'm always writing and even in the gap between my band and my solo career I was always writing but you know the the mechanics of touring and recording are so burdensome that I I need a lot of time away from them but and so here we go what I'm going to do instead because when I told my label this <laughs> they were like <laughs> uh, my label have actually been asking me for a long time to start a Patreon and I was always um, a bit frightened because it seemed like a, a heavy load you know and i, I have pals that do patreons andy from um, arcane roots is a patreon and and charlie from fight start is a patreon as well um i mean lots of people do but these are the people i know 
the label finally convinced me that there was a way to do it it, that would mean I could still keep contact with you know my supporters, these people that have supported me all along, but but that it wouldn't take over my life, so I could concentrate on other things because I want to make a bit of a career change. I want to look at um, acting and presenting. So on Wednesday, I think it is the twenty first. I'm launching my Patreon, the official Jamie Lemon fan club, and you can like subscribe for what a pound or five pounds or whatever you want. And um, depending on the levels, because they all have like membership tiers, you get like a demo, you get to hear like all my like weird demos that I've been recording for 30 years that I've never really played anyone. And you get like a newsletter and you get a, a badge and some stickers. And I'm going to do some art prints. This is another thing Kev from BSM was like, you could do like art prints and send them in the post. And I was like, now nah, I'm listening. You know, that really <laughs> excited yeah. me. And then we're going to do some gigs on Zoom because we did uh, some gigs on Zoom during lockdown that I think everyone really enjoyed and certainly helped me get through lockdown. So if I'm not going to be playing, I'm not going to be coming to your town and playing a show, but I could be coming to your PC. <laughs> and so this is just, it appeals to me as a way to sort of keep faith with everyone and keep contacts whilst I work out the fuck I'm going to do with the, the rest of my time because I'm 41, you know, I've been in the music industry for a quarter of a century and uh, I need a time out, man. So <laughs> I'm going to do the Patreon and see where that leads and, and try and look at other areas. There's your exclusive. How would you feel? <laughs> I absolutely did not see that coming. That, that has kind of blown my mind. I mean, well, it certainly, it sounds like a healthy thing to do and I wholeheartedly support yeah. you in, in doing that. Um, luckily enough, I've seen... Yeah, you know, plenty of your your gigs, so I, I have enough to keep me going uh, in my core. But yeah, wow, that that's quite a thing. Well, and also, it could be exciting. It's a brand new thing to to check oh, out. Maybe you'll become very more tech savvy as it goes. I think so. You know, I I think it's I've always and if you followed my career and we've talked about it in this interview, you know, for me, change has always been the main thing. I, I feel like change is proof of life. You know, if you're not changing. Even in that song, Scared of the Police, like the first single by the band was all about like, you have to change. You can't become a statue and stay still. It's there from the blueprint right from the start. It's what I've always been about. So, and this feels like just another, you know, a big change. It's it's scary. Like I knew it was the right thing to do because it was frightening. Um, and I feel very positive and optimistic and excited about, you know, what what's the future going to hold that I'm not just going to like, oh, here we go. Let's make an album or let's go on the road, you know, again, you know, yeah. <laughs> for the sixth, seventh time in, in 10 years. I want to do something different. Um, so, yes, I'm very excited and very I feel very positive about it. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm excited for you and for those that will be able to enjoy that as well. Thank you very much again for your time in this conversation. I found it absolutely fascinating uh, hearing some insights from your songwriting and everything you're doing and so curious to see what the next chapters are for you in your career. Thank you again. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Thanks, Steve. Well, that was a fascinating discussion with Jamie Lenman. I did not expect that announcement at the end. I knew he had an announcement to make, but I had no idea it was going to be that he was retiring from music entirely. I thought he was joking. I thought he's really leaning into this joke for a long time, but then realized, oh, no, he's very, he's quite serious about this. This is what is happening quite incredible especially after having had that long conversation of looking back on his career of all the music he's created over the years and it's like what's next nothing <laughs> i just blew my mind but he clearly has a patreon in mind where there will be some music in future that you can check out so i've added the link of that patreon uh, url into the description of this very episode wherever you're consuming this podcast so do check that out there will also be a link to the discord server where you can chat to me about this episode or recommend other artists you would like me to interview in future so do consider joining that i hope you enjoyed this discussion and hopefully you'll stay for the future discussions with other artists i'll have on this very podcast very soon thank you for watching or listening <laughs>